on my screen, I have the pri or I have the homepage for the MACT 160M class. And tonight we're going to start on project two or module two. So from the home page, I'll scroll down to the project list, module two, the connecting route. I click on this, it takes me to the modules page and module two connecting rods. I'm going to open up the connecting rod discussion. Everything we need to know about the connecting rod uh, assignment is locating, uh, located on the connecting rod discussion page. So if I click here, it takes me to the connecting rod uh, page. You can see an image of the drawing. All the dimensions we need to build it are provided on this drawing. Uh, there's some other information here, the type of material we're going to make it from, uh, the unit of measure. So we'll go over all that here in a moment. Uh, from previous semesters, here I have the recorded lectures from the spring 2021 semester. So this is the last time that the MACT 160 class was taught. And here is a link to the video, or here is the video for the first part. Here's the video for the second part. And then I've got some links to the Zoom recordings. And what I'll do is I'll replace these with the actual videos embedded in the project page. So give me, you know, a little bit, to, you know, shortly after I finish class tonight, I will remove these links and I'll actually embed the videos. So I've got the videos from the previous semester. And then if you scroll down, I even got videos from last year. So fall 2020. So I've got, uh, two semesters worth of videos recorded, already recorded for this project. And as I demonstrate and record this semester's lecture, I will also post it so you guys have it available to you. So there'll be plenty of resources for you guys to help, you know, to help you guys work through this project. So I've got the drawing or an image of the drawing. I have uh, several sets of videos on how to do the project. If you scroll down, you can see the instructions, modeling the connecting rod or modeling connecting rod. This is what we're gonna go over tonight. And there are one through 13 steps. So this is a bit, this project is a little bit more involved than the previous drill projects that we were working on. And it might take us, it'll probably take us the entire class to get through the modeling portion of this assignment. I scroll down even further, you'll see the creating of the tool paths for the connecting rod. We will not get to this tonight. Uh, this will be for next class, possibly the class after. And just like we had on the previous projects, there's, there are instructions, there are examples of dialog boxes that we need to adjust or make uh, changes to. And down here we see a tool list. And this is a little bit more extensive than the previous projects that we we're working on. The previous projects had a spot drill, a drill of a specific diameter, and a ball mill for engraving. You can see here that we've added several tools to our tool list. And then when you get to the very bottom, there's an actual, there's a link where you can actually download the PDF to the engineering drawing. I'll scroll all the way back up. And looking at the part, and what we're going to do is we're going to start by creating a 2D representation of this part. We're going to dimension it to make sure that the, the 2D representation is correct. And then we're going to use that 2D representation to create a three-dimensional model. So what I'll do, I'm going to go into Mastercam and I'm going to start by creating a rectangular shape. This will be the base feature that represents the, you know, the base feature that we build everything else around. So Let's start by drawing in a rectangular shape that measures five inches along the X and 1.75 inches along the Y. A couple different ways we could do it. We could center the rectangular shape at the origin. We could place the lower left corner of the rectangular shape at the origin and then start placing the other features. I'm gonna do this a little bit differently than we approach the drill projects. I want you guys to see other tools that are available to you that'll help you create models inside of Mastercam. So let's do this. Let's create a rectangular shape that measures five inches by 1.75 inches. I'll go into Mastercam. I've got a brand new session of Mastercam open up. If you don't, let's say you have the previous project opened up, make sure you save it one last time. So you'll go file, save, 
then you go file new. I'm now in a brand new session of Mastercam. The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to create a 2D representation of the part. I'm going to be generating geometry. When I do that, I like to minimize any managers that I have open. That way I can maximize my graphics area. So to minimize any uh, managers that might be open, I'll just you know, go into the manager at the upper right corner, click on the close icon. And I'll do that for the two managers that I have open. You guys might have more, so you'll have to click several times to close out of any managers. Before I move on to creating geometry, I wanna make sure that my wireframe geometry is set to the color that I want. I'm gonna use this green color. And for the solids color, uh, I'll probably change it to this blue right here. I'll start by creating a rectangular shape. The rectangle will measure five inches by 1.75 inches. And I'm gonna center this rectangular shape at the origin, a little bit different than how we've done the other projects. I'll go to the wireframe tab. I'll go to the rectangle tool. Underneath the rectangle tool, you'll find rectangular shapes. This tool gives you more control than a rectangle. So I like to use rectangular shapes. Select rectangular shapes. When the dialog box or the parameters open up for the rectangular shapes tool, uh, type rectangular method base point uh, points. I've got to set the one. These are my default settings uh, for the origin. Set the origin at the center. For the width, click in the width field, type in five. If I hit the tab key, the cursor jumps down to the height field, and now I can enter the value for the Y value, so 1.75. And then when I hit enter, I move my cursor into the graphics area, and you see the rectangular shape or a preview of that rectangular shape attached to my cursor. I'll position my cursor close to the origin, and when I see it lock onto it, I'm getting that uh, preview. You see the small icon popping up next to my cursor that's indicating that it's locked on to the origin. Once I see it lock onto the origin, left click. The rectangular shape is still blue. That means it's still considered a live entity. So if I come over to these uh, width and height values, I can actually change them. So be careful because sometimes if you have your cursor or if you have a field highlighted and you roll your scroll wheel, it will change the value. So make sure that the correct values are in these fields, five by 1.75, and then select the green check, okay. How's everyone doing? We're doing this a little bit differently than we've done in the past. Before I move forward, I wanna make sure that this rectangular shape is positioned correctly relative to the origin. A way that I can do that, I could measure the location or I could check on the XY location of some of the outer corners or any of the outer corners for that matter. If I go to the home tab and in the analyze section, I'm going to go to dynamic. There's a small arrow next to dynamic, click on it. And then from the menu select position. Master Cam has prompted me to select a position. I'll let my cursor lock on to one of the outer corners. Doesn't really matter. The part's symmetric about the origin at this point. So if I left click on this point right here, the X should be half of the overall length and then the Y should be half of the overall height. And because I clicked or selected the upper right corner, I've got positive values in both these fields. So if you select it down here, watch what happens. Same values, just they have negative, um, they have a negative in front of them. So I'm just making sure that I've got my rectangular shape placed properly. It should be symmetric about the origin at this time. If you verify that that is the case, select OK. And you're ready to move on to the next step. I'll go back to the project page and modeling the connecting rod. Uh, 
Once again, uh, we just completed step one. Uh, use the rectangular shapes tool to create the base feature of the part, done. Step two, use the point position tool to create two points at the center of each of the holes. So what does that mean? I go back to the drawing, scroll up. I've got two holes or two drilled holes. We'll just call them two holes because I don't know if they're made by a drill or by a pocketing tool. I've got a 0.75 diameter hole here relative to the lower left corner. It's one inch along the X in the positive direction and it's 0.875 along the Y in the positive direction. Now remember, we place our origin at the center of the rectangular shape. When I place the point that's going to be at the center of this hole and this hole, and actually let's focus on this hole first. So when I place the, pole, the point at the center of this hole, it's going to be relative to the lower left corner. It's gonna be one inch in the X and then 0.875 in the Y, relative to this point, not relative to the origin. So this is how I'm gonna place that point. I'm gonna to go to the wireframe tab, point position. Now, if I hit the space bar, I can enter values relative to the origin. That's not gonna work in this case. So this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna hold my shift key down. So on my keyboard, I'm holding the shift key down. And then I let my cursor lock on to the lower left corner. This is what that, this is where those dimensions are being pulled from. So we're placing this point relative to the lower left corner. Holding the shift key down, let your cursor lock onto this endpoint, left click. You see this uh, axis control, some people call it a gnomon, I've heard it called many different things. I like to call it an axis control. Uh, what you can do in this case, you can place the, the, you can place them individually, or you can enter the X and Y coordinates individually, or you can enter them simultaneously. I'll do it both ways. To move it along the X one inch, I just hover my cursor over the X axis control. You see how it changes to this color yellow? You'll see a scale pop up or a ruler pop up, and then there's a small field. Type in one, hit enter once, hit enter twice, and you can see the axis control or the gnomon move. I hit enter twice. I did not hit enter a third time. So after you hit enter a second time, position your cursor over the X axis control. I'm not, I'm sorry. <clears throat> position your cursor over the Y axis control. I'm not clicking anything. I'm just hovering my cursor over the Y axis. Once again, you'll see that ruler pop up and you'll see that small field with a value in it. This time I'm gonna type in 0.875, enter once, enter twice. And if I hit enter a third time, it creates the point at that XY location. And then I'll select, okay. So that's one way to use that axis control. Let me try a different way. If I select this point, hit delete, I'll do it another way. I'll go to wireframe, point position. Once again, holding the shift key down, I'll let my cursor lock on to the lower left corner, left click. This time, I'm going to left click on the sphere. And you see this field pop up next to my cursor. Now when it moves, you see the values that populate the field? There's an X, Y, and a Z value. I didn't click on anything, I just moved my cursor. On your keyboard, type in one, comma, 0.875. Let me make sure I put a comma in instead of a point. So comma, one, comma, 0.875. Enter once, you'll see a preview of the value. So I got 1.000, comma, 0 0.875. And then the Z value is just zero. So I hit enter once, I hit enter a second time, I hit enter a third time, and it creates the point and places it, replaces it and creates it. From here, I'll select okay. So two different methods on how to use that axis control. I'll do it one more time. This is the first time that we've used this tool. It's um, not very forgiving sometimes. 
So wireframe, point position, holding my shift key down. I'll let my cursor lock on to the lower left corner, left click. Now I can take my finger off the shift key. I left click on the sphere. You'll see the first off the sphere turns gray and then you'll see this uh, field pop up with some numerical values in there. Type in one comma 0.875. So always think of it as X, Y, and Z. So what the X value comma Y value comma Z value. And if you omit the Z value, it's understood to be zero. From here, I hit enter. I hit enter once. I hit enter a second time. And then I hit enter a third time. From here, I'll select OK. And this would be a good time for me to save my work. So what if I, so if I go back to the project page and I jump down to the instructions, I'm jumping all the way to step 13, save the master cam file as connecting rod uh, to the project folder, also named connecting rod. So let's do that. And it's always a good idea to save your work anytime you accomplish something um, that's time consuming. I don't want to have to redo something especially in a work environment or a test environment. So let's do this. We'll go back to Mastercam. Currently not saved. It's in the default folder. You do not want to save your work here. So I'll go File, Save. I'm going to save this in my class folder. So I'll navigate to my class folder on my C drive. I've got a folder for the year. And then I've got some class folders. I've got the MACT 160 fall. That's the class that we're currently in. So I'll open up that folder. And you can see all the projects that we've worked on so far. So I'm going to create a new folder. Inside of the MACT fall 160 class or 160 fall, right click from this menu, go to new folder. And we'll call this connecting rod. You want to call a connecting rod, rod project, that's fine. So I've got a connecting rod uh, folder. I'll go into that folder. And now I'm going to save the master cam file with the same name, connecting rod. I'll select save. And once you save it, if you look at the top center of your screen, you can see the path to where this file is saved to. So I've got mine saved to my C drive. I've got my folder for the year. I've got the class folder, project folder, and then here's the master cam file itself. From here, I'll go back to the project page. We need to create a point at the center of this hole, center of the 0.375 diameter hole. We could use the method that we just created this point with, but what I'm thinking an easier method would be to just copy this point along the x-axis for a distance of 3.25. So I'll use the transform, uh, translate transform tool or transform translate tool to copy this point 3.25 inches to the right along the, uh, along the x-axis. I'll go to transform. Translate. Master Cam is asking us to select entities to translate. I've only got one point on the screen. I could pick select it. I could use the uh, mask selection filter. In this case, I'll just select the point. It becomes highlighted, indicating that it's selected. I'll select end selection. And from here, I'll just come over to, well, first off, make sure that the method is set to copy. Uh, instances, I only need one copy, so I'll leave it set to one. Along the x-axis, enter 3.25. I hit enter. I'm seeing a preview of the copied item. From here, I can select the green check, OK. I now have that second point created. And you'll notice that the original point is red and then the copied point is purple. Uh, what Mastercam is doing, it's assigning temporary colors to the original and to the result. 
And if you leave these colors or if you leave the temporarily assigned colors intact, what you can do is you can come over here and you can select them using the selection filter. So select all result entities or we set or select all group entities. So in this particular case, I don't need to have those, I don't need MasterCam to hold on to those temporarily assigned colors. So what I can do is right click on my screen and from the flyout menu, I'll select clear colors. That completes step two. So this would be a good time for me to save my work. So file save. And then I'll go back to the project page and let's see what we're instructed to do for step three. Before I move on, how is everyone doing? Good. Doing good? Yeah. All right, perfect. I right. have a question. Yes, sir. So I try to create a form for season, and okay. when I try to move it in, it's not popping out. Do you want to check my screen real quick? Yeah, no problem. Let me see what you got. So I'll stop sharing my screen. And then I'll make it possible so that you can share your screen. All right. Okay, so uh, do this. Hold your shift key down. Shift. Then, the shift key. So lower left, one up on your keyboard. Hold the shift key down now, and then left click. Let the lock at your cursor lock onto the endpoint. Left click. There you go. Oh, now, okay. Position your cursor over the red axis control. Don't click on it. Just hover over it. Now you see how the, the ruler pops up and then that blue field. Yeah. Type in. So type in one. It's got to keep, uh, keep your cursor over it. So all right. Now type in one. Hit enter. Hit enter again. Now hover over the Y axis control. The green one. Now enter 0.875, enter, enter a second time, enter a third time. There you go. Oh. Now hit the green check, go to transform, translate, select the point, end selection or hit enter. And then 3.25, I believe, along the, let me see here. Let me look at my blueprint. Yeah, so you need 3.25 along the x-axis. Hit enter. And now if you hit the green check, you should be good. All right, so you have temporarily assigned colors, clear your colors, and you're good. All right, got it. Thank you. Hey, no problem. I'll go back to my screen. Let's see here. Okay, so you should be able to see my screen now. And I'm going back down to the instructions. We just completed step two. We're now moving on to step three. So use the circle center point tool to, uh, to create circles as shown centered on the points created in step two. Kind of a run on sentence there, but let's go on. So we have to reference the drawing here. So the circle that we're going to create for this hole is going to be 0.75 in diameter. And then the circle for this hole is going to be 0.375 in diameter. So let's do that. We'll go back to MasterCam. I'm going to go to the wireframe tab. We're instructed to use the circle center point tool. Now on the blueprint, they give us a diameter value. So you have two ways to define the size of a circle or an arc. Uh, we're gonna use the diameter value. That's what's given to us on the blueprint. That seems to be the easier way to approach it. So first diameter value is 0.75. Enter that value, hit enter. And then when you move your cursor into the graphics area, you should see a preview of that circle attached to your cursor. If I position my cursor close to the first point or the left side point, you see how it locks into position and you also see a preview of a point icon pop up next to your cursor. Once you see it lock into position, left click, that places the 0.75 diameter circle. 
I would like to finalize the creation of this circle and then create the next circle. To do that, instead of hitting the green check, you're gonna hit the blue check. Okay, and create new operation. So what that does is it finalizes the creation of that 0.75 diameter circle. Then it allows us to move forward and create the next size diameter circle. If I go back to the blueprint, the diameter of the circle on the right is gonna be 0.375 in diameter. In the diameter field, 0.375, enter. Once again, if I move my cursor into the graphics area, you'll see a preview of that circle attached to your cursor. I position my cursor close to the point. You see it lock onto it. Once you see it lock into position, left click. We're not done with this tool yet. We're gonna to create two more circles. To finalize the creation of this circle, I'll select the blue check. I'll go back to the blueprint. We're gonna create two more circles. One's gonna have a radius value of 0.7 inches. And then the other one's gonna have a radius value of 0.4 inches. So. Let's create the one on the left side first, the 0.7 radius. And these will be centered or concentric with the existing circles. So I'm back inside of Mastercam. This time they gave us a radius value. So in the radius field, 0.7, I hit enter. I move my cursor into the graphics area. Once again, you'll see a preview of that circle attached to your cursor. I'll let my cursor lock on to the center of the existing circle or the point, whichever one wants to lock onto. In this case, it's locking onto the center of the existing circle. That's fine. Once I see it lock into position, left click. To stay within the tool, I'll select OK, create new operation. That allows me to move on to the creation of the next circle. This next circle is going to have a radius value of 0.4. In the radius field, 0.4, hit enter. You'll see a preview of that circle attached to your cursor. I'll let it lock on to the center of the 0.375 diameter circle. Once I see it lock into position, left click. And then from here, we're done with the circle tool. I can select OK. That exits the circle tool and finalizes the creation of that last circle. This would be a good time for us to save our work. So I'll go to File, Save, and we'll move on to the next step. But before I move on to the next step, how is everybody doing? All right, Zach's good. How's everyone else? Perfect, Dan is good too. All right, so that was pretty straightforward. Let's go back to the project page and see what the next set of instructions are. Scrolling down. So we just completed step three. Use the circle center point tool to create the circles. Step four, draw tangent lines between the circles as shown on the drawing. So what does that mean? Let's look at the blueprint. So this line this top edge, this angled edge right here, and this angled edge right here are tangent to this circle and this circle. And what that means is the circle, or let me rephrase that. What that means is the line is gonna intersect the circle at only one location. So let me show you an example of what that is. So if I use a line tool and I draw a line from here to here, is that line tangent to this circle? And a quick check is, does it intersect it at one, or does it intersect it at more than one location? This line intersects this circle here and here. So that circle and that line are not tangent to each other. To draw a tangent line inside of Mastercam, we're gonna go to the line endpoints tool For the type, I've got free force, free form selected. I've got tangent checked, and then the method is set to two points. 
Now watch how this works. If I select this circle right about here, I'm placing the first endpoint. If I select the circle right about here, you see how the line is attached to the circle. No matter how I move it, it maintains tangency or it maintains that tangent relationship between the line that I'm trying to create and the circle. No matter where I place it right now, it will not intersect that circle in more than one location. So that's what the tangency means here. I'll zoom in over here. Now be careful. I want this line to be tangent to this circle. And when I get close to it, you see how it snaps in the position? It's creating this line tangent to the two selected circles. Be careful. If I select the, or if I position my cursor close to the 12 o'clock position, it wants to lock onto the quadrant. And even though it looks like it's the same thing, it's not. Watch how, watch what happens. So if I lock onto this quadrant, don't do this. If I lock onto the quadrant and I zoom in, you see how that line is intersecting this circle in two locations. That is not tangent. So I'll delete this line and I'll redraw it so it's tangent to both circles. Wireframe, line endpoints. I'll select this circle at around the two o'clock position. I'll pull the line away from the circle. I'm rolling my scroll wheel and I'm zooming in over here. So not that, but if I select it or if I get my cursor close, to, if I get my cursor close to say the one o'clock position, see how it snaps in the position? That is tangent. Left click. I'll select OK, right-click Fit, and this would be a good time for me to save my work. File, Save. How's everyone doing with that tool? Good. good. Nice. So what we have to do is we have to do the same thing on the bottom side of the part, or the bottom side of the connecting rod. I'm going to show you two separate ways on how to do it. The first way would just be to stay within the line tool. If I select this circle at say the four o'clock position and then come over here and just get your uh, cursor close to say the seven o'clock position, it snaps into a tangent position. Left click, select okay. You just need to be careful, stay, stay away from the quadrant. So in this case, stay away from the six o'clock quadrant on this circle and the six o'clock quadrant on this circle. So that's one method. There's actually several methods I'm gonna show you too. That would be probably the quicker method because you'd already be in the line tool and you could just move right into the creation of the second line. But let's say I did it a different way. Let's say I wanted to mirror this line about the origin to create this tangent line or this tangent edge down here. If I go to the transform tool from these different tools, you can see, oh, so inside a position, you've got mirror. Opens up the mirror tool. Master Cam is asking us to select entities to mirror. If I select this line and then select end selection, by default, it's going to mirror about the X axis, which works in this case because I'm modeling this part up so that it's symmetric about the x-axis. And a lot of this can be symmetric about the x and the y, but this particular feature is symmetric about the x-axis. So from here, I'll select OK. Because this tool, the mirror tool, is under the transform tab, once again, it's assigning temporary colors. To clear those colors, right-click, clear colors. And from here, I'll save my work. How's everyone doing? Yeah. Nice. All right. Let's go back to the drawing or go back to the instructions. If I scroll down. So step four was draw tangent lines. We've done that. Step five, 
use the offset entity tool to create the angled lines of the pocket. What does that mean? If I go back to the drawing, so here's the pocket on the part. The angled lines are this edge and this edge. What's the distance from the outer edge that we just created or the outer lines that we just created to the inside edge of this line or the inside edge of this pocket? What's the distance from there to there? Point 0.1. Point 0.1, it's given to us by this dimension right here. So what we're instructed to do is we're instructed to use the offset tool to offset this line inboard 0.1 inches and then offset this line inboard 0.1 inches. I go back to master cam. Inside the transform tool, you'll find offset. Now this, this tool is also available from the wireframe tab. It's over here. I got offset here. I got offset entity, offset chains. Uh, I'm more in the habit of going right to the transform tool and using this one. It's just um, out of habit. I don't, I don't think one's better than the other. It's just a way that I approach it. So in this case, offset entity for the distance, type in point 0.1. For the method, have it set to copy. And master cam is telling us to select the line, arc, spline, or curve to offset. I'm going to select this line right here. I left click on it. And then you look and you see that master cam is now telling us indicate the offset direction. Pick on the side of the selected line that you would like to offset to. So in this case, I'm gonna pick below. I wanna offset it inboard. So if I pick below, left click, you see that offset entity or that line being offset 0.1 inboard. That's what I want. So double check your value, 0.1, copy. I would like to stay within this tool uh -huh. and create, I wanna stay within this, I wanna finalize the creation of this line. Then I need to do the same thing down here. So I'll select, okay, create new operation. Uh -huh. I'll select this line. Once again, Mastercam is asking us to indicate the offset direction. Select above in this case. Double check that the value is correct. Make sure it's offset in the right direction. Uh, if you offset it in the wrong direction, you can always change the side that it's being offset to. So you've got options, selected side, opposite side, or both sides. In this case, I want the selected side. And from here, I'll select OK. And this would be a good time for me to save my work. But before I do that, I'll clear colors. And then I'll select File, Save. How's everyone doing? Good. And once again, it's always a good idea to save anytime you work through a step or accomplish something significant. I don't like redoing things. Um, especially at work and when you're in a test environment, you don't want to lose your work so safe frequently. From here, I'll go back to Mastercam. I'm sorry, I'll go back to the project page. Uh, step six. So we just completed step five. Moving on to step six. Use the divide tool to trim back the circles and the lines created in the previous steps. Okay. So we're using the divide tool. And actually, I think I'm going to use, yeah, I'm going to use the divide tool in this case. So, so the divide tool you'll find under wireframe. Now you have a later version of the software, so it might be located in a slightly different location. Um, under modify, you should see divide. If you see it, left click on it. Now the way this tool works, when, it, when it's activated, 
and I've got trim selected. As you position your cursor over things, they'll take on this glowing dashed appearance. And that's an indicator that that will be the part that's deleted. So you, when, I, when I select this line or hover over this line, the part where my cursor is closest to or the, where my cursor is sitting on top of, it's taking on that dashed appearance. If I left click, watch what happens. It's trimmed away. I could come here. Now I'm zooming into the circle. It's all where your cursor is positioned. So in this case, it's positioned over the gap. If I left click, it's trimmed away. I'll do the same thing down here. I'm rolling my cursor to zoom in and out. I'll select this segment of the line, and then I'll select this area of the circle. I'll scroll out. I need to do the same thing down here. So using the divide tool, I'll just exit the divide tool real quick. Wireframe, divide, type, I've got it set to trim. Whatever you hover over is going to change to this dashed appearance. When you left click on it, it's trimmed away and deleted. Once you're done trimming back the circle and the arc, exit the tool, hit the green check, and save your work. How are you guys doing with that tool? Okay. Something's popping up on my screen. Oh, don't want that. Okay. So from here, I'll go back to the project page. We're moving on to step seven. It says use the fillet entities tool to create the 4.175 radius fillets on the inside of the pocket. So what does that mean? Let's take a look at the drawing again. These rounded corners right here, the radius value is 0.175. They're referred to as fillets, F-I-L-L-E-T-S. And we have a tool called fillets or fillet tool to help us create these radius corners. So this call out right here, this R.175, 4X. So, Radius value is 0.175, and then there's four of them. So 4x means that there's four of them. We have a tool that will help us create this feature. If I go to Mastercam, under the wireframe tab, on the far right side of your screen, you'll see modify. And I'm looking for fillet entities. Now, there's fillet entities, and underneath it, you'll find fillet chains. In this case, I could use either of these tools, but I'm gonna use the fillet entities tool just to in introduce it to you guys. So I'm using the fillet entities tool. Before I start clicking on things, I'm going to set the radius value. So in the radius field, 0.175, enter. For the method, I'll leave it at the default normal. And then the settings, once again, this is a default. I've got trim entities checked. Now, when I put my cursor or position my cursor in the graphics area, watch what happens when I place my cursor between two, two of the entities. So if I select this line or this arc and this line, it creates that 0.175 fillet between those two selected entities. But it also is a tool It'll make a, um, it'll kind of, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't want to say it's going to assume it's what you want, but it's going to give you a preview of what it thinks you want. So if I position my cursor between the two, you'll see a preview of a fillet. If I left click, it creates it. So there's two different methods here, maybe even more. You can select both of the entities, or if you position your cursor in between the two, close to where you want the fill to be created, you'll get this preview. And once you see the preview, left click. And then you can do the same thing over here. But in this case, I'll do it the other method. I'll select this line, and then I'll select this arc. 
looks good. From here, I'll select OK. Now I'll undo it real quick. So undo, 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 undo. I'll do it again. Wireframe tab in the modify section, fill it entities. I set my radius value to 0.175. The method, I'm using the default normal. And then the settings, I'm also using the default trim entities checked. You can left click. So select an entity, I select this one, select another entity. Or if you just position it close to the center or the midway point between the two, left click, left click, left click. So that's a little bit quicker than selecting two separate entities. From here, I'll select OK. And I'll save my work. How's everyone doing? OK. From here, let's go back to the drawing. What am I missing? As far as the 2D representation of the part is concerned, I think I have everything. OK. Let me look at the next step. So we just completed step seven. Uh, step eight, create the standard levels that we will be using in this class. So if you can't remember what the levels were, uh, standard levels, uh, there is an image provided. So um, I'm going to create seven levels. I'm going to name them so name them like we see here. And then I'll make the dimensions level the active level. And we'll dimension the part to make sure that the 2D representation of the part is correct. So I'll go into the master cam. I need to bring up the level manager. To do that, I'll go to view, managers, levels. I currently have 20 entities on level one. Level one is named solid support geometry. So I'll double click in the name field. We'll call this solid support geometry. Create a second level, select the green plus sign. To name it, double click in the name field. We'll call this solid model. Create a third level, click, uh, select the green plus sign, add a new level. To name it, double click in the name field. We'll call this wireframe from solid. Level four, I'm going to reference the project page. Level four will be the dimensions. Add a new level, double click in the name field, call this dimensions. Level five, we'll call it points. Level six, we'll call it material. And level seven, we'll call it name. The next step is to create the dimensions. I'll make the dimensions level the active level. And I'll also change the wireframe color to red. So I'll go to home under wireframe color, set it to red. So now anything I create, any type of wireframe geometry I, that I create will end up on the material level and it will be red. So from here, I'll go to the drafting tab, scroll out a little bit. We're gonna reference the project page. If I go back to the project page, I wanna double check. So we just created um, the level. So we just, uh, we just finished step eight. Moving on to, uh, these are numbered incorrectly. So this is actually step nine. I'll fix this. Uh, so. We're going from eight to nine, which is use the smart dimension tool to mention the two, two dimensional representation of the part. What I'm going to do is I'm going to match my dimensions. They don't have to be perfect, 
but I'm going to place my dimensions similar to what I'm seeing on the blueprint. That way, when I double check my work, it's a little bit easier for me to, you know, verify that everything's there. So let's do this. Let's start by creating the length, the height, and then the whole position dimension. So one, two, three, four, five dimensions. Let's start by creating length, height, and point, uh, point position. And what's more important is that the, we verify that the, the circles are located in the right, uh, right location. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna put the points on the point level and make that level invisible. To select all the points on my screen, I'll select this icon, select all point entities. To change the level that they're located on, I'll go to the Home tab. In the Organize section, I'll select Change Level. I want to move these points to level 5. So I've got Move selected. The Active Level is 4, so I'm not going to use Active Level. <clears throat> So uncheck, use active level, and then in the number field, type in five and hit enter. You'll now see that the two point entities have been moved to level five. From here, I'll make the points level invisible. Can't see the points anymore. Make sure that the, the dimensions level is the active level. And let's create those dimensions. I've got one horizontal for the length and then one vertical for the height. Is it okay if you show how you move those points one more time? Oh, sure, no problem. Let me make them visible. I'll start by moving them back to, uh, let's move them to level two temporarily, then we'll move them to level five again. So there's a couple different ways you can do it. I'm gonna start by selecting the points themselves. So I'll come over to the, uh, selection filter, left click on the upper left half. They became selected. I haven't even gotten into a tool yet. I'm just pre-selecting them. So with them selected, I'll go to the home tab. In the organize section, you'll see an icon, change level. We're gonna move them. What level do you wanna move them to? Let's move them to level two first and then we'll move them back to the correct level. So. When you first open it up, it says use active level. Well, if you have the wrong level set, how can I say this? <clears throat> if you don't have the correct level set as active, you, you don't want to move it to it. So uncheck use active level. And then this field becomes available to you. Enter the number of the level that you would like to place those points on. So this is temporary. I'm going to actually send them to level two. So I type in two and hit enter. You can now see that zero entities reside on the points level and the two entities, the two points reside on the solid model level. That's not where I want them. So I'm gonna move them to level five. Once again, I'll pre-select them. Select all point entities. They become selected. From here, I'll go to the home tab. In the organize section, change level brings up the change level dialog box. We're gonna move them to level five. So in the number field, highlight it, type in five, and then select okay. And now the points have been moved to level five. Make the dimensions level active, and then we're ready to start creating the dimensions. That help out? Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. So from here, let's dimension the 2D representation of the part close to what we see on the drawing or the image that's provided to us. I'll go to drafting, smart dimension. For the overall length, I'll just select the top horizontal line. Now, when you create that first dimension, something that I'll do, um, you can see the size of the text. You can see this 
you know, which side of the arrows the or what or what side the arrows are on. Um, right away, if I need to change the font or the text height, I just come over here and where it says height, I might increase this. And then you see how the fonts a little or the, the height's a little bit bigger. Not a problem. Um, if you want to change it back, just while the, the while the dimension is active, select height 0.15. Select OK. While the dimension's active, I can flip the arrows around. So I want the arrows flipped to the inside. I'm hitting the A key to do that. You can also come over here and where it says arrows inside or outside, here's another way for you to control those or control where the arrows are. I've got to set the inside and then I'll place the dimension right about there. I'll now create this uh, vertical dimension, the height dimension. I selected the line, I pulled the dimension off of the part, and then left click to place it. From here, I'm going to dimension the position of the two circles. Now, what I wanna do is I wanna position the, I wanna dimension the position of the circles. I'm not concerned about the position of the point. So, I go back to the level manager, make the points level invisible. I'll start by selecting this vertical line. And then I'll select the center of this circle. And then I'll pull the dimension down off of the part. For the distance from center to center, if I select this circle, then I select this circle. Now it's dimensioning into the outer quadrant, so that was probably not what I wanted to do. So I'll hit escape and then I'll go back to the center of this circle and then the center of this circle. 3.25, that's correct. That's what I want. And then the distance from this edge to the center of the circle, I'll select the bottom horizontal line. And then I'll select the center of this circle. And I'll pull the dimension off of the part. From here, I'll go back to the project page. I've got um, five dimensions that dimension either the diameter or the radius. I've got three radius dimensions and two diameter dimensions. So let's do that. I'll start with the diameter of the 0.75 diameter circle. Now, the smart dimension is a little tricky when you're, uh, when you're dimensioning a circle. Watch how this works. I'm gonna select, get close to around the four o'clock position. When I see the circle highlight, left click. I'll pull the dimension off of the part. Now, depending on how you pull the dimension away from the circle, you'll get different results. I pulled away at around the, say the four o'clock. And you can see that it's a diameter dimension, 0.75 in diameter. The arrows are on the inside of the circle. I can flip the direction or the side that the arrows are on. Come over here, I'll select outside. And I'll use this type of dimension. When you dimension a circle inside a master cam, a full circle, it's going to default to a diameter type dimension. When you select a partial circle or an arc, it's gonna to default to a radius type dimension. So here, I'll position my cursor close to the 0.75 radius arc, left click. I'll pull the dimension off of the part. Then I'll move on to this radius here, I believe it's 0.4. Position my cursor close to the circle, or I'm sorry, close to the arc. You see it highlight, left click, pull a dimension off of the part. For the 0.175 radius fillets, I'll posi position my cursor close to this arc, left click. And I'll pull it out right about here. 
And then for the 0.375 diameter, I'm positioning my cursor at around the four o'clock left click. I'll pull a dimension away from the part and left click to place it. I go back to the blueprint. I believe I have everything except this 0.1 dimension. So from here, I'll zoom into this line and this line. Now be careful, I'm gonna select this line and then I'll select this line. And then you see how it creates this type of dimension. If you move your cursor away, it starts doing some strange things. So what you wanna do is you wanna get, you want to get it to lock into the type of dimension that you're looking for. This 0.1 is what I'm looking for. Don't worry about placement just yet. Just get it to dimension it at 0.1. You can see that the arrowheads are perpendicular to the selected lines. That's what you want. So get it close, left click. If you want to reposition it after you place it, all you have to do is left click on it. And now it maintains uh, the type of dimension where the arrowheads are perpendicular to the selected lines. And that's what I want. So from here, I'll position or place the dimension off of the part. I'm done dimensioning the part, I'll select OK. I'll save my work. And we're now ready to move on to the next step. So now that we've created all of the dimensions, I'll go back to the project page. And you can see that I renumbered these. So step nine, we just completed step nine. Uh, we created the dimensions. Uh, step 10, use the extrude tool to create a solid model of the part. So I'm inside a master cam. Um, when I move forward and start creating the solid, I don't want the dimensions level to be visible. So I'm gonna make the solid model level visible. I'll make the dimensions level invisible. And because I'll be giving it some depth in the Z, I like to look at it from the isometric view. So right click from the flyout menu, I'll select isometric. And what we're going to do is we're gonna create the solid model, we're gonna create the base feature of the solid so that the 2D representation of the part and the origin stay on the top of the part. It's not necessary that we do it this way, but this is just a, a method that I like to use in most cases. So what I'll do is I'm gonna start by extruding the outside rectangular shape to create the base feature. And that feature or that extrusion is going to be 0.625 inches and overall, or that's gonna be the length of the extrusion or the distance for the extrusion. From here, I'm back inside of Mastercam. I'm gonna to go to Solids, Extrude. That brings up the wireframe chaining dialog box for the mode. I have it set the wireframe or the C plane, or let's select C plane. It was on 3D, select C plane. And then for the selection method, select chain. So mode, wireframe, C plane, and then selection method is set to chain. Select one of the lines that represents the outside profile of the rectangular shape. And when you do that, all connected entities become selected. From here, I'll select okay. you'll see an extrusion being created. It's being extruded in the uh, default direction. So the positive Z, uh, I'm, I'm going to flip the direction. So I'll select change or reverse all. You can now see that the wireframe geometry and the coordinate system are now sitting on the top of the part. For the distance from the, from the blueprint, you'll see this dimension here, 0.65. Set the distance to 0.65. I hit enter. And then from here, I'll select OK. And that's the base feature of the part. I could have stayed within the tool. I could have selected uh, OK and create new operation. But in this case, I'm just going to create the base feature. And then I'll go back to the extrude tool and create the next feature. So what we need to do now is we need to cut away 
the material between this profile and this profile. So we're cutting away the region of material between the two selected profiles. To do that, we're gonna use the extrude tool again, but we're gonna create an extruded cut for a depth of 0.3. I'll go back to Mastercam. From the solids tab, where it says create, in the create section, I'll select extrude. That'll bring back the wireframe chaining dialog box. The mode is set to wireframe. I have C plane selected, and, and the selection method is chain. I'm going to start by selecting the same chain that I used to define the outside profile of the part. And now I'm going to select this line. Now it's giving me grief because as I hover over this face, it's highlighting the face. So what I can do, I can go to a wireframe view. And now it lets me hover over the geometry, the 2D geometry that represents the elevated boss. So here I'll select this line. I have two chains selected. From here, I'll select OK. It's hard to tell what's going on, so I'll go back to a shaded mode. In this case, instead of using create body, I want to use cut body. Now it's cutting away the material that's within the two select the region. It's using the two selected entities and it's removing the material that's between or the region that's within the two selected entities. It's holding on to the default distance. Set the distance to 0.3 and select OK. So I'm using cut body. I've got two chains to define the region that's being removed. The distance, I have it set to 0.3. You might have to flip the direction. And if everything looks good, select OK to finalize the creation of that cut. From here, I'll look at it from an isometric view. I'll fit my screen. I'll unzoom 80%. And then I'll save my work. So now that we've made this cut, I can go back to the blueprint. I need to make three more cuts and I could do these. I could combine some of them, but what I'll do is I'll keep them all independent of each other. I'm gonna make a cut for this hole. I'll make a cut for this hole and then I'll do an extruded cut for this pocket. So I'll go back to master cam. Uh, before we go any further, uh, yes. I wasn't able to do the last extrude. All right, uh, let me take a look at your screen real quick. Hold on. May I see your screen? Yes. Okay. So I selected the side. Um, I can't right see here. your... Oh, I see it now. Hold on. Okay, so what you're going to do, you got two chains. And you've got cut body. So do me a favor, right click in the field uh, where, it's, where it says chains one and two. I want you oh, to yeah. right click in there and just uh, rechain all. Remove or rechain all works. Uh, either one, rechain all is what I want. Yep. Okay, so now do me a favor, go to a unshaded mode or a wireframe view, bottom right of your screen. You're right there, perfect. Now, I want you to select the outside profile. Perfect. Now I want you to select the profile that represents the elevated boss. Yep. Looks good. Um, hit OK. Uh, hit reverse direction. The, the blue and the green, yeah, that one. And now go back to a shaded mode. So what was going on is you were telling the cut to go 
upward and there was no material oh, okay. to, to remove in that direction. So that looks good now. Okay. All good? Okay. Yeah. All right, cool. So cool. we'll go back to my screen. Let's see here. Thank okay, you. so you, you're welcome. So you should be able to see my screen now. And we need to make three more cuts. We need to cut the 0.75 diameter circle or create the 0.75 diameter hole, the 0.375 diameter hole, and then the pocket. So from here, I'll go back to the solids tab. Once again, we're using the extrude tool. Brings up the wireframe chaining dialog box. I'm gonna use the same setting. So I've got wireframe, C plane selection, selection method is set to chain. Now it's giving me some grief when I try to select the chain that's sitting on top of the solid. So I'll just toggle over to a wireframe view. And then it allows me to select the wireframe geometry easily enough. I'll select okay. I can see the cut going through, even though I'm in a wireframe view, I would prefer to be in a shaded mode, just a little bit easier to see. I need this hole to go all the way through. So it says 0.75 through and then 0.375 through. So I'll set the distance to through all. And then I'll select okay. We'll do it again. We're gonna do it with the 0.375 diameter circle. So I'll go to solids, create, extrude. Same settings with the wireframe chaining dialog box. Uh, I'm gonna change over to a wireframe view. I'll select the 0.375 diameter circle. I'll select okay. Uh, in this case, through all will work again. So I'll leave that set, I'll leave that setting alone. I can change over to a shaded view just to check my work. You can see that the hole is going all the way through the pocket. I'm sorry, all the way through the part. From here, I'll select okay, create new operation. Or I could just select the green check. If I wanted to stay within this tool, which I'm going to do, I'll just select okay and create new operation. That brings back the wireframe chaining dialog box. Once again, I'm gonna change over to a wireframe view. I'll select the geometry that represents the pocket. From here, I'll select okay. Now, while I'm previewing the cut that we're creating, I'll go back to a shaded mode. And you can see the cuts going all the way through the pot or all the way through the part. We do not want that in this case. So here I'll change to distance. And according to the blueprint, the depth of this pocket is 0.125. I'm getting it from the section view right here. So the depth of this next cut is gonna be 0.125. So distance 0.125, I hit enter. You'll see the model update. From here, I'll select okay. I think we're done. If I look at the part, if I look at the, if I compare it to the isometric view, isometric view of the blueprint, I believe we have the solid model complete. So from here, I'll go back to master cam. As soon as I finish creating the solid model, I want to turn off the solid support geometry. Reason being is if I alter or delete or accidentally do something to the wireframe geometry that's used to create the solid model, I could corrupt my file. I'll definitely create some headaches for myself. So what I like to do is I like to protect this geometry. I put it on its own level. <clears throat> and as soon as I'm done creating the solid model, I'm going to make that level invisible. So Make the solid support geometry level invisible. Make the wireframe from solid level the active level. Anything we create is gonna be placed on the active level. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a wireframe representation of this part. Go to the home tab. I'm gonna change the wireframe color to something that I'm currently not using. I'm thinking this gold color right here. So wireframe from solid is the active level. And then the wireframe color is set to something that you haven't used yet. 
And I like to use colors that are easily easy enough to see with the current background color and the color of my solid. So I chose this gold color right here. Uh, before I move forward, let's look at the project, the instructions on the project project page. Um, step 11, use the curve all edges tool to create the wireframe representation of the part. So that's what we're about to do. Level three is the active level. I've got the color set to what I want. I'll go to the wireframe tab. In the curve section, use curve all edges. Master cam is prompting us or telling us how to select the geometry that we need to create the, to create the wireframe geometry from. And in this case, I wanna create a 3D representation of the entire part. So I'm gonna use the very last option, triple click to select the solid body. Yours might be worded a little bit different. So somewhere on the part, you need to triple click. And when you do it correctly, the entire part becomes highlighted. If you just have a if you if you just have a single face highlighted, reselect it. You want the entire part to be highlighted. The entire part is selected. Once you have the entire part selected, select and selection. You can see the edges become highlighted, and what Mastercam is doing is it's creating wireframe geometry on all the edges of the part. From here. And before you hit the green check, make sure you're set to 3D. Because if I'm set to 2D, it's going to create edges on a two in a two-dimensional plane. So make sure this is set to 3D. And then select OK. Master Cam created 52 wireframe entities to make the 3D representation of the part. From here, I'll look at it from an isometric view. I'll fit my screen and then I'll unzoom. And this would be a good time for me to save my work. How's everyone doing? All right. Good. Good. Okay, so from here, Let's go back to the project page. We're on step 12. Use the create letters tool to create your first and last initial on the top of the part. Reference the drawing for the size of text and location. I don't think there's any information telling us the information related, for, related to the initial. So what we'll do is we'll improvise. We're gonna center the initials in the pocket or close to it, close enough. It doesn't need to be perfect. And we'll use a font size. Let's increase the font size from the previous project. We used quarter inch last time. Let's use a half inch. Let's see if it fits in that pocket well enough. So we're just gonna place some initials in the bottom of the pocket centered, close enough or close to that. So what I'll do We could change over to a 2D construction plane. And then for the Z value, so change the 2D construction, change over to a 2D construction plane, and then left click in the Z field. And that brings up this field. Right click in this field, and then select Z coordinate of a point. And what I want you to do is I want you to lock on to something that represents the bottom of the pocket. And if you do it correctly, the Z value should be negative 0.125. And let me check on that. I might've made mine incorrectly. Oh, that's correct, I'm good. So back inside of Mastercam, I changed over to a 2D construction plane, and then I set the Z value to negative 0.125. And how I set that value is I just picked up, I picked a, a piece of that pocket, a, a feature 
on the part that represents the bottom of the pocket. So I grab this endpoint right here. And then you see Z is now a negative 0.125. So anything I create, any two dimensional geometry that I create will be placed <clears throat> on this face or will be playing with this face. So at Z negative 0.125 relative to the current coordinate system. From here, I'm gonna look at it from a top view. I'm gonna to go to wireframe. And before we create this geometry, make the name level, the active level. And then once again, change the wireframe color to something that's different, something that we haven't used that we can see well enough with the current background or the current color of the solid model. So I'm thinking this burgundy color right here. I should be able to see that well enough against this uh, background color of the part or the color of the part. So I changed the color. I made the name level, the active level. I'll go to the wireframe tab. Create letters for the style. Let's use Mastercam box font again. Create your first and last initial. And right away, you can see that the initials are way too large at one inch. So I'm going to set this to 0.5. And once I hit enter on that 0.5, I move my cursor into the graphics area. And you can see my initials attached to my cursor. I'm just gonna get it close. I'm using, I could, I, I could use the origin to kind of get an idea, but I'm just, um, I might be better if I turn my cord system off. And I'm just gonna position, I'm gonna get it close. It doesn't need to be perfect. Get it close, left click, select okay. And now if I look at it from an isometric view, the dimensions, I'm sorry, not the dimensions, the letters should be at the bottom of the pocket. If everything looks good, once again, look at it from an isometric view, fit the screen, unzoom. I'll change back over to a 3D construction plane. The value that's in the Z, um, in the Z value right here, will not have any impact on what we're doing because we're set to a 3D construction plane. I'll save my work. And I'll usually uh, turn the name level off, but we don't have to do that at this moment. We'll do it when we start creating tool pads. So I've got my initials placed at the bottom of the pocket. I'll go back to the project page. And I'm looking at the next instructions or next set of instructions. We are here. Use the bounding box tool to create the solid representation of the material. So we're going to create a solid model that represents the material that this is going to be machined from. Before we do that, I'll go back to the blueprint and let's see what the instructions tell us to do. It says make, so in the notes, it says make from a five inch by 1.75 by a point, or sorry, five inch by 1.75 by five eighths thick 6061-T6 aluminum. The decimal equivalent of five eighths is 0.65. So the basic dimensions of the part are already there. All we're going to do is we're gonna machine the profile of the boss. We're going to machine the holes and then we're going to machine the pocket and then we're going to probably chamfer the sharp edges. So the bounding box that, we, that we're going to create or the material represent, representation that we're going to create is going to match the dimensions that we're seeing on the blueprint. So five by 1.75 by 0.65. So let's do this. We'll go back in the master cam. We'll make the material level, the active level. 
Once again, I want to change the colors of the geometry that we're creating. We're going to create a solid this time. So I want to change the solid color to something that I haven't used yet and something that's really not going to match up with any of the wireframe geometry that we've already created. So I'm thinking at this time, this, this color right here, this magenta, uh, this purple magenta color right here. Material level is the active level. I've changed the wireframe color. From here, I'm going to go to wireframe. In the shape section, I'll select bounding box. To select everything that's currently on my screen, I could select control A on the keyboard. I'll select end selection. You can see that Mastercam is creating an envelope that captures everything. It's creating a rectangular envelope that captures everything that's currently visible on my screen or everything that, everything that we selected. And if you look at the dimensions, the X, Y, and the Z, they match the dimensions of the material that we're instructed to make this from. So five by 1.75 by 0.625. Scroll down. And where it says create geometry, I want you to uncheck lines and arcs and then select solids. Once you do that, select OK. You now see a solid model that represents the material that we're going to machine this from. Real quick, uh, Professor, on the yes, uh, rectangular settings on the origin, is that does that remain at the center? Uh, this lower center everything every, um no uh, my origin right now the origin of master cam is at the center of the part top top face centered yeah and that's okay for now we're gonna when we uh prior to creating any tool paths we're actually going to create a custom coordinate system which we haven't gone over yet so that'll be something we do next class and uh, it's, it's just another thing that I want to show you guys, another thing that you guys need to be comfortable with. You're not always tied to creating geometry relative to the default coordinate system. You can create the geometry any way that you want, any way that's convenient or the most, you know, any way that's efficient for you to do it. Um, we can always create a new coordinate system and place it wherever you need it to be. And then the tool paths that we create We'll reference that custom or that new coordinate system. Does that make sense? Yeah. Can you just show your, your coordinate system real quick, if you don't mind? Yeah, sure. Not a problem. I turned it off when I was creating the initials, but it's it's right on the top of the part, centered. Got it. Okay. All good. And this was strictly for construction purposes. When we go to create tool paths, we're going to reference a completely different coordinate system. Got it. Got it. All right, cool. So from here, I'll make the solid model the active level. I'll make the material level invisible. I'll look at it from an isometric view, fit the screen, unzoom. This is just <clears throat> a habit that I have. I'll save my work. And from here, I'll go back to the project page. And if I get down to step 13, or actually we just we just completed step, ah, I got two 13s, I'll fix that too. So we just completed step 13, we're moving on to step 14, and we've done step, step 14, uh, save the master camp file. We've done that several times. I always recommend saving your work after you complete something. Um, as you're working your way through a project, as you make progress, save your work. You don't want to have to redo something and you don't want to lose you know, work that you've done, you don't want to lose hours of work. It would just be very counterproductive. So we're done with the modeling portion of this project. The next thing we'll do, and we'll start this next class, is we're going to start creating the tool paths for the connecting rod project. This is where I'm going to stop lecturing tonight. Next class, we'll start creating tool paths.